typically what happens is we end up starting a little later than we intended and then we get all caught up in it and it's time to break and it's hard to break because we're caught up in it. But uh, we must. We're going to go ahead and begin this evening uh, this plenary session. And we've asked Minister Virginia Graham to come and uh, host us in a, in a word of prayer and uh, uh, praise and worship is to be prepared to lift up a song of praise. If, if they're not in place by that time, that's fine. We praise us anyway and we will go forward with the remainder of the service. Elder Bratton is here and we're looking to be enlightened and strengthened through the word of God. Amen to that? Amen. Let's receive Minister Graham as she will come. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for bringing us to this most holy place one more time. Come on and give God a praise. If you're blessed right where you sit, we're blessed right where we stand. Come on, door of hope and others. Come on, let's offer up a praise unto the Lord for what's been imparted into our spirits, what's been imparted into our minds, what's been imparted into our future. Amen. We thank and we praise God for every clinician. We thank and we praise God for every plenary session. We thank and we don't take it lightly. These are jewels. These are jewels that the Lord has brought before us to enhance us, to enlighten us, to help us to develop and to grow and to be nurtured. Hallelujah. So I don't take it lightly, but I count it a privilege and an honor. So we're going to go before the throne of grace, but we're going before the throne of grace in praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going before the throne of grace with the worship in our spirit. It's an other opportunity for you to give God that which is due to him. Father, we thank you. You've been good to us all day long, and you didn't have to be, but you've been good to us. You've been mighty good to us all day long, and we, we came back to give you what's due to you. That is our worship. That is our praise. Hallelujah. We came back, Lord God, with an open heart that we might receive even the more from you. I need more of you, God. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, you gave us strength and health. You kept us covered under your blood that no harm or danger would come upon us. You blessed us to drive down the highway, God. Hallelujah. Without any accident. Hallelujah. And we tell you, thank you tonight. You brought us together one more time. You brought us together in this time of corporate worship that we might lift our voices. We might lift our voices like a, like a trumpet inside and tell you, Thank you, Jesus. You didn't have to, but you did. You didn't have to keep us, but you did. You didn't have to save us, but you did. And we came back to tell you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord God. As we left our homes, Lord, we prayed over them. We prayed over our family members, oh God, that they would be better when we get back. Because we came to you, and we worshiped you. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. We thank you for the kingdom of the arts and media. We thank you that this is not just a coming together of people who are gifted and people who are talented. No, 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 no. But we are learning how to be better stewards over that which you blessed us with. We're learning, oh God, how to be more masterful in our crafts, that we might give you a holy praise, that we might give you more worship, that we might give you a better praise, and we might give you a better worship. Lord, help us, oh God. Forgive us of us, our sins. Forgive us of the things, oh God, that we keep tripping over. Forgive us of those things in our spirit that are not like you. And we ask you to take it out, Lord. The old song used to say, search me, Lord. Search me, Lord. If you find anything, when you find anything that's not like you, take it out, Lord. Take it out and strengthen me. I need more strength. I need more strength than when I open my mouth, your word come forth. When I open my mouth, it blesses somebody. When I open my mouth, it lift the people of God. So we thank you tonight. We thank you for forgiveness for all that we've done wrong, what we said wrong, what we thought that was wrong, what we felt that 
that was wrong. We bring it all to the altar tonight. And we ask you, Lord, clean us up, wash us, purge us, use us to your glory. We thank you tonight, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, right now for this moment in time that you've set apart that we should come and learn of you. Thank you, Lord God, for the spirit of unity that surely in this place. We thank you for the spirit of oneness that is surely in this congregation. We thank you, Lord God. We pray tonight. We pray over these gifts. We pray over those that are gifted to lead us in worship. And we're going to lift them. We've heard Pastor Wendy Wyatt. We're going to push them. Yet, God, we're going to exalt them and esteem them in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, for the kingdom of the arts and media, for every soul that's going to be made better because of this coming together. We thank you, Lord God. We rebuke any foul spirit. We rebuke anything that's not like God. We rebuke anything that comes to hinder our worship. We rebuke anything that comes to hinder our praise. We rebuke anything that comes to hinder these pastors and their congregations. Lord, it is our prayer that every congregation, every pastor, every senior leader that is represented here will only go higher in you and deeper in you. There's nowhere to go but higher. There's nowhere to go but deeper because we're being challenged. Our souls are being challenged to move in Jesus. We thank you that we won't be stagnant. We won't think of. We won't mark time. But Lord, we'll lift our voices like trumpets and Zions and we'll run towards you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. I said, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. And everything that's in me, bless his name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, magnify. Oh, magnify. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Yes, Lord, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me out of all my fears, looking unto God, who is able to keep us. He's able to sustain us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In a world that we don't understand, when we look at the world collectively, you're still God. You're still God. I don't care what it look like. You still God. Thank you, Jesus. I don't care how confusing it may be to your mind. He's still God. And we thank you tonight. You reign. You reign forever. Reign on us tonight. Bless us tonight. Lord, as I pray this prayer, somebody somewhere, somebody somewhere might be in a valley, even though we're surrounded by gifts of God. Somebody came here burdened. You're not going to leave that way. I came to tell you, even in the valley, make it a valley of praise. Praise your way out. Worship your way out. Give God what is due to him. Let him bless your life. I thank God for this day. I thank God for this opportunity. We'll be praised. We pray, Lord God, for our leaders. We thank you, God, for our our national leaders, international leaders. We pray for nations around the world. Oh God, that need God. We know what they need. The media doesn't know, but we know they need you. We still need God. So we pray for foreign nations. We pray for the wars and the rumors of wars, oh God. Yes, God, that you are the God that will cause wars to cease. Yes, God, so we're trusting you. And we're standing in the gap for nations that are at war, for casualties and dead bodies that don't have to be so. We ask you, Lord, stretch out your hand. Stretch out your hand, dear God. Have mercy. Have mercy when mercy can be found. We thank you. Make us a people of prayer. Help us to keep a praise. A praise on our lips and a prayer down in our spirit. Help us, Lord God, to walk upright. Walk upright before you. That you would withhold any good thing. When we pray, we go see results. When we pray, we're looking for answers. When we pray, we're looking for better. We trust you for better. 
in the name of Jesus. On our national level, we pray for our president, Joseph Biden. We pray for our vice president, Kamala Harris. We pray, God, that they pray. We pray, God, that they seek you. We pray, God, that they long for you. They long for your wisdom. They long for your understanding. And God, even if we don't see it, we're going to believe you for it. We're going to stand in the gap and we're going to pray till something happens. We're going to believe you, God. We thank you, Lord God, on the state level. Do your thing in South Carolina, North Carolina, and every state that's represented. You be God. Let us be your people. We're the sheep of your pasture. Another voice we will not hear. We will not render to. But we thank you tonight. We thank you, Lord God. And we thank you, Lord. We dare not. We dare not leave this platform without giving you, without giving you praise, honor, and glory for our leaders, oh God. We thank you for our pastors. We ask that you continue to cover them with your blood. We ask that you continue to cover them. Keep them. Give them long life. Satisfy them with long life. Full of your strength. Full of your wisdom. Full of your ability to take the people to higher heights and deeper depths. We bless you, Lord God. If there's any sickness in here, we call it down. If there's any ailments in here, we cast it down. Any bad feelings, any broken hearts, it's going to be mended tonight. Whatever you need, God's got it tonight. Don't leave without it. It's in your praise. It's in your worship. Your deliverance is in your praise and in your worship. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you, you gave us one more chance. Thank you for another day that you've kept us all day long. And our minds are still on you. You kept us all week. Some of us had to strive and go to our jobs, but you kept us. And then we didn't think of robbery to come back and tell you thank you. If you're really grateful, if you're really grateful, if you're really grateful, open your blessed mouth. Put your blessed hands together and give God. Give God what he's owed to. He's due. Give it to him. Lord, we give it to you. Every section, have your way. Have your way in this place. Come on, one more time. Come on, people of God, one more time. Let's offer up praise. Let's offer up worship. He lives in your praise. And he lives in your worship. To God be all the glory. To God be all the glory. Hallelujah. Yes, God be all the glory. Come on, one more time, clap your hands and give God praise. Come on, he is a worthy God. I said he is a worthy God who is likened unto our God. Who can find another like our God? For a thousand generations, there is none like our God. Hallelujah. Come on, clap him like you really love him. Come on, open your mouth, Zion. Somebody need to shout to him. Somebody need to give him glory. He is worthy. Worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the setting of the same sun. The name of the Lord is worthy. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. He is a mighty God, and he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Anybody came to give him glory? Anybody come to worship him? Anybody come to praise him? Hallelujah. Do you have anything to thank him for? Do you have anything for which you're grateful? Hallelujah. I mean, the old 
old song used to say, I got so much to thank God for. What about you? I got so much to thank him for. How about you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
and lovely name of Jesus may we give those who are streaming with us and virtually connected a round of applause let's do it with all sincerity praise God and then to those of you who are in the building we certainly honor you and I'm going to ask those of you who are in the room that you would take a moment of fellowship please just step out from your seat and greet some people in the name of the Lord Thank you, Lord. Greet a few. Brother Smith.
God bless you. And you may be seated if you will. Thank God for another opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank God for Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, the Bible says, and they continued, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The Bible says that they continued with one accord steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And so that means more than shaking hands, but shaking hands is a good element, a good way to start. Amen. Praise God. And so um, I want to uh, ask that you would embrace the opportunity to embrace one another because of the fact that we never know when things will change and the opportunities that we have will not be accessible. Amen to that. Amen. We're going to move forward. We're going to, we're going to omit everything else. We will have the offering at the end, but we're going to move to the presentation of the Word of God and uh, the man of God who's going to be sharing with us. We're going to present him. We will not be introducing him to most of us, but we will be presenting him on this occasion. And um, it is my privilege, my honor to do so. Um, I don't know if it's pronounced Vallejo. All right. It's been a long time since I studied Spanish, but I'm okay. Vallejo, California. He wrote a couple songs when he was in high school, but didn't get serious about songwriting until 1988 when he came to New York and worked with Elder Timothy Wright. He was his music director for about 20 years. Um, I'd love to read every detail of this. He told me not to read any of it. He wrote the verses to Vicki Winans, How I Got Over, her song Alive, Alive. Wrote Selah for the GMWA Mass Choir, which was nominated for a Dove Award in 2007. Safety in the House of the Lord in 2003 for Timothy Wright and the New York Fellowship Mass Choir. Wrote Psalm 63 for Greater Allen Cathedral. Uh, I'm going to ask him about every praise, so I'm not going to read what this says about every praise. I'm, and so I'll omit the rest of this. Listen, listen, this, this young man has been a blessing to us from the moment that we had the privilege of meeting him. He was a blessing actually before we met him because um, the first time I saw him was by means of video presentation. And uh, I'll say more about that. I said met, encountered him, was by means of video presentation. And from the time that I had the privilege of meeting him in New York through the interposition of Pastor Preston Harrington, we had the opportunity to greet one another. And from that day to this, there has been a knitting of the heart that, uh, that continues to grow even deeper and ever deeper. We're very pleased to know that though he hails from Vallejo, California and has invested much of his adult life in the New York, greater New York area, New York City area, that he is now, at least to a large degree, an inhabitant of South Carolina <laughs> by virtue of the fact that he is a part of the faculty of the Benedict University there in Columbia, South Carolina. In the capital city, HBCU, he is uh, 
leading the gospel music program, gospel choir program there. He's going to say a little bit more about that. Uh, he has moved among many of the most influential ministries of our day. Uh, I think about Brooklyn Tabernacle there in the greater New York area. This is not an African-American church in terms of the populace being exclusively African-American. This is one of the most influential churches in the evangelical world. And they have, they have embraced him fully. Uh, and so God has used him to move in denominational, non-inter-denominational settings with grace and with poise. I'm grateful to God also tonight. Um, I, I, um, when he came into the office, he came by himself into the office. And I almost wanted to kind of say, well, you know, we're glad to have you, but where is the first lady? But as it turns out, she was on the premises. I just said, we thank the Lord for first lady. Belina Bradson, come on. Veteran educator and musical gift and all of that. All of you have ever um, watched her um, as he's moving in music, she is so engaged and such an asset, such an asset. And then we're blessed to have his mother with us this evening. Mother, please stand and let the saints acknowledge you. Praise God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. We consider ourselves honored. We consider ourselves honored. And so um, thank you. Thank you. I'm grateful for all of the presenters who've, who've shared and I do want to ask, before we bring Elder, I do want to ask uh, those of you that, that have been in the various sessions, would you please give voice vote if you were blessed in what you heard received tonight. Amen. Amen. That's great. That's great. I'm glad to know that you are edified. And so at this time, we're going to move to the next level of edification. I want to ask that everyone would stand and express our profound appreciation for this elder, this psalmist, this songwriter, and now this professor, Elder David Bradford. Would you clap your hands as he comes? God bless you, sir. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Praise God. You may be seated. I'm going to... Uh, ask Elder a couple questions before we, as they've said in some settings, turn him loose, so to speak, and he'll be able to share as the Lord has given it to him. Um, we're, we're very grateful. Uh, Elder, uh, when I saw your image first and heard your voice first, well, actually, I, I didn't hear your voice. I heard your organ. I didn't hear your yeah, voice. Yeah. Um, it was on a VHS tape. Right. Um, it was Myrna Summers and Timothy Wright. And the, the project was entitled, if I remember correctly, We're Going to Make It. I know that's the, the song that got the most traction from that project. How many of you know and or remember We're Going to Make It? And, 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 and there, was, there was one or two settings. There, there was a, there was a, a segment where, um, you know, the, the worship had gotten mellow and an organ solo was being played, and I heard Sister Myrna say, play David, play David, play David. I said, wow, who is David? Because he is wearing this organ out. And uh, I had no idea, though, that, that one day I would get an opportunity to meet David. Uh, sir, talk, talk about that. Pro I, I know it's a long time ago, but just talk about it. That's priceless. Bishop Gilbert Earl Patterson, it was in the facility before the great facility that they now have. Talk to us just a little bit about how that came together. Um, a little bit about the behind the scenes that brought that to be. So, um, well, thank you, Bishop, for the opportunity to be here. Bless y'all. How's everybody doing? Uh, so, when I worked on that project, um, uh, I had just recently, a few years before that, come to New York. And the way, when I first came to Elder Timothy Wright, um, he brought me in 
uh, as a, uh, he, as soon as I came, because he had just done a workshop at, my, at Benedict, and he told me while I was at Benedict, he said, if you ever move to New York, call me. So when I got to New York, I called him. <laughs> and so he asked me if I would play for the concert choir. And I said, sure, you know, and you know, this. So he's like, well, how much are you charging? And I really didn't, you know, that wasn't really my thing. I was like, well, you know, just let me play first and let me, you know, be a blessing to the ministry and then you figure it out, right? Because that was never my thing. I just, you know, I just was honored to be there. And so, but when I came, all his musicians quit. You know, and because they didn't understand how this guy from out of town could all of a sudden be part of the band, and they felt like he was showing more favoritism towards me. So the whole band quit. And so I'm on keys, and I'm, you know, I'm honestly, because I, I had never been in that setting, I'm oblivious. I just think they're not there. And one of the uh, evangelists, Liz Wright, was part of the choir, yes, yes. and her brother was a drummer. And so he started playing drums when they didn't show up, and he became the drummer because he was the only one there. And uh, so it was me and him for a long time, and then, uh, I don't know, about six months in, it's just me and him. And so I'm playing keyboard, bass, and piano, and he's playing drums, we're doing what we do. And another choir member said, hey, I know this bass player. And she brought a bass player to one of our engagements. And me and Dwayne looked at each other like, okay, if he's good, great. If he's not, we'll keep doing what we do. Um, that bass player, his name was Reggie Young, who became one of the greatest bass players of gospel music yes. across the world. Yes. He literally showed up at the engagement without one rehearsal and nailed every song. And for the next three, four years, it was the three of us, right? And uh, so that particular recording um, was very interesting because uh, when you play for Timothy Wright, you have to kind of, you know, work your way into being able to record. And uh, there were a couple of sessions that happened around that time because there was a Myrna Summers project but there was also, before that was recorded, Who's on the Lord's Side? Yes. Yes. But Who's on the Lord's Side almost didn't come out at all because one of the record executives wanted to sing on Who's on the Lord's Side and Tim didn't call him up. Oh, wow. And because he didn't call him up, that record, uh, Who's on the Lord's Side, was put on the shelf. <laughs> so then we... Um, I don't know if you know uh, an evangelist named Reuben Steen McClure, but she was very prominent in Church of God in Christ. Yes. So Savoy and Elder Wright wanted to record her, but uh, somehow or another, they never got the consent for her to record. So the songs that were supposed to go to her went to Myrna Summers. Oh, wow. And so all of those records that we do with Myrna Summers were supposed to be done with Reuben Steen McClure. And, to, this, and uh, to the time that Ruben Steen McClure passed, she never had a record. And that was the record that was supposed to be for her life. So when they let Myrna Summers start hearing the songs, before she heard the song, she says, whatever songs you have is a yes. She had never heard any of the songs. And when I did that solo, that project was the first project they let me play organ on. Wow. Right? Because the previous project before that, recorded before that, was Trouble Don't Last Always. Yes, yes. And when I did, uh, we did the rehearsal for Trouble Don't Last Always, myself and Reggie um, uh, played in the rehearsal. And then, but uh, Jeffrey White and Anthon White ended up doing the session. And so when I got to the session, I really didn't have a position because Benjamin Love, who played for the Winans, was on one keyboard. Anthon White was on the other. So they set up a, an additional keyboard for me on the piano. And it wasn't even in the monitors the whole session. But I had to know what I was doing. So God had blessed me with perfect pitch, which I just found out about while I was in college. I didn't even know I had it. 
So I'm playing the keyboard the whole session, not hearing anything that I played while I was recording. But I just knew the notes that corresponded with the notes I was playing. So when the session came out, I heard all my keyboard parts on the record. So then the next record, they put me on an organ. And I ended up doing an a organ solo on that project that uh, brought me to the forefront of the musical world because I started getting phone calls to produce and do all these things simply because Myrna Summers said, play David. Okay. And my name got out there, so, you know, there's always a story. Isn't there something? That's, that's amazing. It's amazing how God makes moments. Oh, my goodness. And uh, he taught us that if we manage a moment, it can become a movement. Come on. Ooh. And, um, and I think we're watching that movement even now. Amen. I, I had three questions, so uh, I'm going to try to make the brief. The second okay. one, uh, tell us a little bit, if you would, about um, how every praise, we, we are so elated to be able to say that every praise was taught and sung here, here first. Years before. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. Any, every praise, who <laughs> remember that? Come on. Right. Uh, talk to us. One of the reasons why I asked that uh, Elder would do this, Kingdom of the Arts and Media, Arts and Media is just a, a, a phrase that is intended to encompass all the various giftings, all the various talents, and uh, you know all the terms, propensities, aptitudes, all of those things. It, it, it's designed to be a comprehensive opportunity for us to apprehend and comprehend how the way God made us is designed to advance the kingdom of God. I made a statement last night, and I'm going to make it again just so I can add a little clarity. I talked about the fact that there are people who have a psalmist gift even though they may not be singing the gospel or singing for the glory of God, but that was psalmist's gift. I want you to be clear on what I meant when I said that. I'm talking about the natural gift. There mm -hmm. is a natural gift and there is a supernatural gift. Absolutely. Or divine gift. And God is the giver of both. So an individual who has a compelling musical gift may not be saved one iota, but that compelling musical gift is the gift of psalmist. The gift of psalmist, he or she may not occupy the office of psalmist yet, but that natural capacity which will house that supernatural anointing, God has given that to that individual because every good gift and every perfect gift is from God. And he lighteth every man that cometh into the world, not just the saved. Uh, so I, I wanted to, to clarify that. And, 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 and say further that the reason why we're having this conversation is because many of you in the room are, are psalmistically gifted, Levitically gifted, or maybe some other gift, some other gift, but it corresponds. It corresponds to the fact that you need someone to help tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. I remember right. this, and you'll remember it. The Bible says that when Rebecca, who was the mother of Esau and Jacob, the wife of Isaac, couldn't have children for a long time. And then when she got pregnant, her husband prayed her to pregnancy. That's not all, but, but that's what he did. He prayed her to pregnancy. The scripture says that she began to have difficulty in the pregnancy. And the Bible says, she said, if it be so, mm -hmm. listen to this, if it be so, why am I thus? If it be so, if God has answered prayer, if God has a purpose and plan, why? Is it tumultuous inside me? Why, why is there a war going on inside me? If this is of God, why is there an internal struggle? Yes, sir. Well, I don't think that Rebecca is the only one who has that question. Yes, if it be so, why am I thus? You, you got it? So, so the Bible says she inquired of the Lord. And the Lord said the reason why it's thus is because new, two nations are in your womb. I won't elaborate. My point is that there are Rebecca's all in this room who are saying to God, if it be so, why am I thus? And so listening to the testimony of a, a man of God such as this can help shed some light on why it is thus and why you are thus. That makes sense? Okay. All right. So, so some of you are songwriters. Some of you are 
script writers. Some of you are recipe writers. Some of you are code for computer writer, program writers. But, but you still need your writing to be received, to be heard, and to be positioned, right? And so when we ask him about every praise, I don't want you to shut down, I, I, I don't do music, no, no, no. But you create something. You need to listen to another lowercase c creator because deep calleth unto deep. All right, so, so Elder, we got every praise, and you even recorded every praise on your own uh, project. Um, talk about how every praise went from being Elder David Bratton's concept to being a worldwide phenomenon. Literally, you do know I mean literally, world, global phenomenon. People all over the world literally sing this man's song. Yes, they do. And of course, you know about the news report with the, the, the abduction and the child was supposed to be perhaps molested, killed, what have you, and the child started singing every praise and the abductor had to turn her loose. Right. Yeah. National news, yeah. church. So talk to us about how something that began with a pregnancy mm, yes, sir. became a phenomenon. Listen, that's a word right there. If you missed that, <laughs> woo! So uh, actually, so you know, every praise was recorded four times before Bishop Walker and never saw the light of day, right? Um, four times. Four times, right? And doesn't mean that it wasn't a good song. It's just that God had a design and a time, right? So God had a time for that to happen. I went to, and I'll tell you how I got to the rehearsal. My friend Dwight calls me, he says, hey, Dave, um, I want to go to Bishop Walker's Azusa rehearsal, he said, but you have to go, because if you go, I can go with you. They'll let me in. That was his whole thing. And I said, yeah, I just go. They'll let you in. I said, you know, I'm not going tonight. He said, no. He said, let's go. I want to go tonight. He said, I work a lot, so this is the one night I can go, so we really have to go. So I said, yeah, I finally consented. I said, okay, I'll meet you there, all right? So long story short, he never shows, right? But I get there, and J.J. Hairston is training the choir for Azusa. So I just walk in and sit down and enjoy it. And J.J. says, he, while he's teaching, he says, you going to teach something? And he keeps on teaching the song. And I said to him, I can. He, and so then he leans back and says, go ask Bishop Walker. He's getting ready to leave and go preach. So go ask him before he leaves. So I go in the back. I ask Bishop Walker. I said, can I teach a song to the choir? He says, sure. Just tell J.J. to put you up. All right? Relationships. Somebody say relationships. Yeah. So I go back to the front. JJ says, well, now I have a song by uh, David Bratton. So I had a whole bunch of songs in my head. And I kept hearing, ah, every praise is too simple. Every, it's too easy. It's not, a, it's not complicated. Like, you know, it doesn't have a lot of Richard Smallwood and Walter Hawkins changes and this and that. It's just like, you know, a few lines. And I'm getting on the organ, and I'm conflicted in my head about what song, and I just started singing every praise, right? And so when I, I said, okay, well, that's what it's going to be tonight. It's going to be every praise. And uh, so while I'm teaching it, you know, I'm seeing choir members there on their phone and blah, blah, blah. So later I find out that they're texting Bishop Walker to sing, um, you need to get back here and hear this song that David Bratton is teaching. So before, by the end of that rehearsal, we get a message. Bishop Walker wants to call a special rehearsal two days later. And so two days later, he came and he heard every praise. And he said, well, he asked me, he said, what do you want to do with the song? I said, Bishop, just take it around the world and let God use it. However, you, you know, however God gives it to you, it's fine. And uh, so uh, we recorded it. Um, I didn't hear anything else until, I don't know, maybe about a, a month before it came out. And uh, first of all, Bishop Hezekiah Walker, you may not know this, but uh, when he has you come in to teach a song, he takes none of your royalties. Wow. Right? Now, that's big that's because big. Uh, 
Uh, I know writers of songs whose songs were super popular and they lost all of their royalties because they were, the artist said, you know, you know, who shall be nameless? The artist said, well, um, it's standard that we get your publishing, which was not the truth. He said it's standard, and so if you're new and you've never had a song come out on the market, you just go with it, right? And I believe that those were moments for us to teach our own community how the business of publishing worked so that generations throughout our community would know how it worked. Yes. And so, but we were so um, greedy, right? And when I, but Bishop Walker was like, uh, Dave, you keep your royalties. He said, give a tithe to Love, Love Fellowship. And he said, and he said, you give a tithe of your f publishing to Love Fellowship, I'm good. Right? So you have to ask yourself, are you okay with giving a tithe and keeping the majority of a song that has the opportunity to be visible in every country on the planet? Yes. Or do you want 100% of $5? Right? Help us, help us. You have to make the call. Right? Um, uh, so I was like, no problem. And Bishop Walker and I had been friends for maybe 25 years. Somebody say relationships again. Relationships. Right? Um, I didn't get to teach the song because I was talented. I didn't get to teach the song because my reputation for writing and all of that. I got to teach the song because we had a relationship. Right? We, had, we, we were friends. If there was never another song we did together, he always called me his brother, right? And so the relationship, as soon as I walked in the door, the relationship spoke louder than the gift, yes. right? And so I never negotiate um, money with people. I just go in and do 100% of what God gave me. And I feel like if I do 100% of what God gave me, whatever I get in return is going to work for me. Right? So every praise is now in uh, six, 60 countries, 120 languages around the world. Right? Um, can I, I, so I'm going to tell you a little, uh, this. So you remember the funeral of George Floyd, right? Yes. You remember the fl funeral of Breonna Taylor. You remember the funeral of Aretha Franklin, right? All of those funerals did every praise. Right what? now, as a matter of fact, Aretha Franklin, her funeral, every praise wasn't on the list to be sung at all. And the congregation sung it. And it was on CNN with the congregation singing it. Uh, with George Floyd, that funeral was on ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, CNN, uh, MSNBC, CNBC, the PBS. Every station you could name played that funeral. Yes. Right. And so the royalties from that song being played on those funerals dwarfed all the royalties I had gotten when the song came out. Right? And something like that, I could never say that I planned that. Right? Nobody has marketing genius like that in their pocket. It has to be the grace of God. You know what I'm saying? And if you are open to trusting the grace of God with every part of your being, he will make it make sense at levels you could never conjure. But that's the grace of God. Why don't you respond to that? A man's gift maketh room for him and bringeth him before great men. Somebody read that and they thought that meant a man's talent. Yes, sir. A woman's skill makes room for her. That's not what it said. Because that skill and that talent, that's not your gift, that's God's gift. And the Bible does not say God's gift makes room for you. It says a man's gift right. makes room for you. So, Brother Blue, if it's not the talent or the skill, 
You say that's God's gift. What does it mean when it says it's man's gift? It means that you take what God has given you and give it. And your giving of what God gave you is what makes room for you. God's gift makes room for God. But when you take what God has given you and give it, what did he say? He said to the preacher when he asked him how much did he charge? He said, you have to work that out. Let me just give the best of what I have. His gift has him receiving royalties from CNN, ABC, NPR, and all the rest. I asked you to respond, and it was very weak. You don't understand. You don't discern. Somebody ought to praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to magnify God, and somebody ought to figure out that the Bible didn't say a man's sales make room, a man's gift makes room. You give now, you'll be able to sell it later. Give it now. Your problem is you got dollar signs for pupils and you don't understand that the first step is give. You won't show up on time, give. You won't be loyal, give. Won't be accountable, give. And that will make room for you. This man's, this man's, this man's accomplishment is the outworking of a lifestyle of giving. Not just giving money. We're so blind when it comes to that. It's not giving of who you are. Giving of the grace that's on your life. One other, and, and it's all yours, sir. That's so powerful. That's, that's overwhelming. That's overwhelming. Goodness. He said, did you hear what he said? Now the song, the, the Bishop Hezekiah Walker project has been sung around 60 countries, 120 languages. But he said that by means of some funerals. Come on, sir. By means of some a series of unscripted, unplanned funerals. And even in the funeral, the song is not on the repertoire to be sung. And yet God sets this up in such a way that the outcome and the income from the funeral dwarf everything that came from what was scripted and what was orchestrated and what was planned. It sounds like God has a way it sounds like God has, he says, my, my, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher. Shake somebody's hand and say, you haven't begun to imagine. Oh, you ought to say it better. Father, please give us one more chance. Tell them you haven't begun to imagine what God can do through the grace that he's placed on your life. Get that hand again and ask him, did you ever read Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20? It's still in there. It says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or imagine. Brother David has come to quicken your imagination. So that, wait a minute, from last night, so you won't have to bow to that other image. He never did bow. He never did compromise. He never did sell his soul. You made me see. The last question is very simple very direct question but I'm going to yield to him not only for the answer to that question but to just take his liberty with whatever the Lord has given him for this moment the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and um, you have stepped now into uh, an arena where your wife dwelt for many years the arena of professional education. She's, as I said, a tenured educator, uh, uh, a, uh, an administrator, mm -hmm. just all of that. Um, but, but, but you've stepped out of all the wonderful things that you've achieved. Here you are at 
an HBCU, where, where you matriculated actually. Yes, and if I may use the term without seeming to be unkind, revitalizing an aspect of that school that, that needed a fresh infusion of, yes, sir. of, of yes, sir. grace and power in that area. Talk to us about the significance, the significance of that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the platform, it's all yours. <laughs> but but uh, the Bible says, the Bible says that when God appointed the priests and the Levites, he said that there was a period of time during which they were to serve. And there was a certain age where he took them out of active service and said from that point on they ought to instruct the next generation of Levites. You, you just mentioned something about your age uh, a little while ago I, I, in the office. I think it's noteworthy the steps of a good man that God has placed you in a position where you are formally doing what you've always done, instructing and mentoring and molding intentionally another generation, another generation in a university, a university that is designed to mold minds, to mold culture, and to send forth leaders. And there you are in the, in the crux of that kind of context. Talk to us about the significance of that kind of open door. The floor is yours. Amen. So uh, being at uh, Benedict College is like a dream for me. Um, I went from being a high school kid to a, to a young man on that campus. Um, uh, so uh, Benedict has been, I met my wife there in my sophomore year. Um, I got filled with the Holy Ghost in my junior year. So all of my not all, but many of my significant experiences happened during that time at Benedict College, right? So my assignment was Benedict College, but the blessings were so extended out uh, beyond that, right? Because God took me to South Carolina um, the way I got there. so. I'm a senior in high school. I'm not sure where I'm going to college. I applied to a couple of places. So one day, this, uh, my mom says, well, we're going to have a guest at the house. This tall man comes to our house. Uh, and my mom said, yeah, this is the president of Benedict College. And, you know, because my mom's an alumni. She's 93. She's sitting here. Amen. Thank God for her. Amen. I'm going to talk about her in a minute. <laughs> um, so... He comes to our house and, and he says, have you applied to Benedict? And I said, no. He said, well, and he says, well, just apply and see what happens, right? This is the president of the college saying, just apply and see what happens, right? So um, I never take um, comments in passing lightly, right? Because uh, I've learned over the years there's no such thing as an idle word, right? So I'm like, okay, you said apply. Here we go. I applied to Benedict. I also applied to Tennessee State. And I had, my, I had made up my mind I was going to go to Tennessee State. I applied, never got a response. Applied again, never got a response. Applied again. So I had a, a mentor of mine who graduated from there, he called the school, and they lost my application three times, right? And, but then I went to Benedict, right? I promise you God knows all of this way before you even imagine, right? So I go, I, I apply to Benedict. Uh, about two weeks later, I get a letter in the mail, you have a full ride, four year scholarship, right? So that, again, was the grace of God. Somebody say relationships, right? Because my mom had a relationship um, that spoke into my life. And from that time, and when I got to Benedict, uh, I made up my mind. I said, well, 
I'm from California. Nobody knows me. I can carve out my reputation any way I want to because nobody knows anything about me. So I started wearing suits every day, right? I was like, I'm going to wear a suit every day no matter how hot it is. I might be sweating like a crazy person, but I was like, I, I want to wear suits, right? Not, not understanding that that spoke volumes to the professors. It spoke volumes to the administrators. So while I'm not saying anything to them, I'm saying something to them, right? So uh, I graduated from Benedict, go around the world. I've been around the world traveling, uh, music ministry all over the place. Um, last year, had to be around this time last year, maybe a little later, I get a call from Benedict College and they say, um, uh, so are you ready to come back home? And I said, well, what do you talk? They said, we need you to come back, take over the choirs and, and just uh, give us new direction for the choirs here at the school, right? And uh, so we just want you to think about it and we'll call you in a couple days. Same day Benedict calls, the church where I got the Holy Ghost calls and says, uh, we think we need to hear you. Can you come and preach? So every time Benedict would call, the church would call. And every time the church would call, Benedict would call, right? So I'm looking up at God like, okay, you got jokes here. You know? I see you doing what you do. And um, so I said yes to work with both because I just saw it. I saw the parallels. Um, and when I got to Benedict, um, uh, I, I ran into, uh, you know, I, the re relationships I have here with uh, Bishop Blue are phenomenal because I've met so many great people. Uh, Ramel, um, also Bishop Freeman, who's in Columbia, and they started to call me and say, hey, we hear you're a Benedict. And because of those, somebody say relationships, because of those relationships, uh, Bishop Freeman said to me, well, we weren't going to have any college choirs this year, but since you're here, we're going to flip it around and you and Ramel bring the colleges and we're going to start doing the colleges again, right? And it was all because of the relationship that I had with Bishop Freeman. And um, so coming back to Benedict, I've been able to give out scholarships to young people who are talented and gifted but had no money, yeah. right? Um, uh, what's the bass player's name? Uh, Josh Kaysen, right? So I met him uh, when I brought the choir last year, and he said he wanted to go to school. So we get him in school, give him a scholarship, and he's now a student, right? So... You know, they said, they, so people ask, well, how do you pick who you want? And I said, well, um, I am looking for young people with a moral compass, right? Because the culture, I believe that there's a revival, a revival designated for the college campus, right? Because you are feeding the next generation of leaders. You are training them. You are uh, nurturing them. And so I don't believe a college campus can function correctly unless the presence of God is a part of it, right? So uh, I spent, so this year I worked with a president artist, um, uh, uh, Dr. Leon Jeter, and um, they brought me in and they said, just do what you do. And I said, well, you know, I'm a church guy and I'm going to talk to them about the grace of God. And they said, once again, just do what you do. And about a month ago, uh, we sang at Founders Day, and the president, she said to me, she said, and she, you know, she says, well, Reverend Bratton, this is what she called, she said, Reverend Bratton, um, your ministry has lifted my whole soul. And so I knew that I was doing an assignment, right? Um, part of, sometimes, we see jobs, but not the assignment that is connected to it, right? And so you minimize its value when you can't spot the assignment. So, um, 
So I, I, there's a couple things I want to cover, and I'm going I'm I'm to go as fast as I can. My wife always clocks me and tells me you've been up too long. So, uh, uh, so the topic is um, when I thought about this, because a, a bishop asked me to talk about my life and my journey. Uh, and if I could say, give it a topic, I would say that it was crafted by the potter's hands, right? Uh, so uh, let me set this up and then I'll kind of give you my story. Uh, there is a powerful parallel between the making and the molding of clay in the creative architecture of pottery making and the creative anointed manipulation our own lives as followers of Jesus Christ. A potter shapes clay. Right? God shapes us. God is incorporating our imperfections, not just to mold us, but to complete his divine perfection. So it is amazing to me that uh, whenever pottery is made, there are imperfections that become part of the final masterpiece, right? So it leads me to understand that there are imperfections in perfection, right? Um, uh, there, it, it, so the relationship between the potter and the clay is very interesting because there is no negotiation involved between the potter and the clay. There is no feedback or resistance from the clay concerning the potter. There is no resistance to the potter's technique, not to his vision, not to his purpose or his plan. The potter has complete control of all levels and determinations in the totality of the creative process. You have never heard of the clay assuming the role of the potter. When each facet of creation is correctly assigned in its designated role, a masterpiece is the result. The process may not be optimal for the clay, but the finished artistry of the clay proves that the potter knew the clay and saw expectation in the clay that the clay never would have seen in itself. That's why the clay never gets to choose. If you are in the hands of God, and you're in the hands of the, of the one that created everything about you, don't you think he knows your capabilities better than you? And if his track record says he never makes a mistake, why not put all of your eggs, your rolls, whatever you want to call it, in his basket? Right? Um, so, uh, okay, let me move. So, okay, here we go. Uh, so my life, right, um, as a musician, uh, my first opportunity playing an instrument, I played for my home church, and I got $10 a week, right? But I played for free two years before that because I didn't care about the money. I wanted so bad to play that I waited for that drummer to not show up. <laughs> I waited. And my first drum set was from that same church. They bought a new drum set and, threw the, and were going to throw the old pieces in the garbage. So they put them in some lost closet. And I asked one of the deacons, I said, you got them old pieces. What are you going to do with it? He said, we're going to throw it in the garbage. He said, if you want to take them, get them out of here. So I took the broken pieces. Somebody say broken pieces. I took the broken pieces of this drum set. And I took it to my house. I put one tom on my bed. I put one on a little table. I, I propped up the the uh, the. Uh, bass drum because it didn't have both legs I propped it up I propped it up and every Saturday my mom and my dad would go to the church to uh for to prepare for 
the uh, Sunday school for Sunday. So when they would go to the church, I would set up these drums and play to my heart's content on this broken drum set, on these pieces that were meant for the garbage. And I played and I practiced. To me, they were brand new out the store. You hear what I'm saying? And I took those pieces. When I took them out to church, they were like, what you taking that junk for? It's, all, it's falling apart. In somebody else's mind, it was falling apart. But in my mind, it was more than what I had. See? So I took those, and I started playing to my heart's content every Saturday. I played for hours and hours. And I would put on all kinds. So in my neighborhood, I grew up down the street from me was Sly and the Family Stone. Right? They are from my neighborhood. Like, they rehearsed at the school for dropouts, which was down the, house, down the block from me, right? Um, uh, Sly used to show up at a church around the corner from my house and sing on Sunday nights and sing Amazing Grace. So I'm thinking these are just people in the neighborhood. Another group called Confunction went around the world playing funk music. They all went to my church, right? So I'm on this street with all these bands and all these people doing all this music. So... I don't realize I'm walking into their, like I was just walking, when they were rehearsed, I just walk in and sit. And I kept walking in and sitting. And I kept walking in and sitting. And then one day, the drummer didn't come. Right? And so they were saying, how are we going to rehearse? And I said, well, I learned all the songs at my house on the broken drums. Right. So they said, well, if you can just get on the drums and just hold the beat, then we can we'll just rehearse until the drummer gets here. So I got on the drums and played every song like the record. Right. And they looked back at me as if they were like, so. It didn't matter to me what kind of instrument I had access to. I was willing to make it work. You know what I'm saying? Um, so uh, let me keep moving here. Uh, uh, okay, my college encounter, the first time I dealt. So that was my first time actually um, uh, getting paid. And um, it was $10 a week, but I didn't care. And then my mom taught me how to pay tithes out of the $10 a week. Right? Um, if there are holes in your pockets, it's because you're not paying your tithes, right? Yeah, right? Um, so let me, give you, let me give you a sober picture of where I'm at. Right now, I have, if I believe if I'm correct, I think five streams of income, right? Uh, I work at Benedict, right? I work with a ministry in New York on Sunday afternoons. I work with another ministry in New York, right? I also have a publishing deal, and I also do engagements, right? So in all of those areas, I always tell God, however you set it up, I'm good, right? And so, but for all of those, the way, it, the way, I, the way I do it is whoever is paying me I pay tithes to that ministry. The reason I do that is because I don't ever want them to think that I don't follow the principles of God. Right? And um, musicians, uh, so, you know, there are some great musicians, I will say that, but then there are those who say, I'm going to pay tithes at my home church, and nobody has a track record of you paying anything. Right? So, no matter how much work you do, you never seem to have enough, right? Whereas uh, when you pay your tithes, that's a principle, right? And the Bible says he gives seed to the Uh-huh, yeah. So uh, I don't have a lot of time, but can I talk to you about another principle that's in the Bible? Can I show you something? Okay, uh, can you pull up a scripture for me? And I'm, I'm shifting gears. Can you pull up a scripture for me, uh, Ezekiel 44, 30? 
if you could pull that up for me. So, um, first of all, uh, Bishop, uh, uh, when I met Bishop Blue, I had been, he didn't know that I had been listening to his preaching for like a year and a half because Jeff Davis came here and he had tapes from when he did the project with Andrew, Andy Ford. So he comes back to New York with these tapes in his car and I hijacked the tapes. So after the next year, I spent looking for Michael Blue. I contacted every Michael Blue on Facebook, <laughs> right? Sent them all a message and they said, and most of them said, other people have done the same thing. I am not him, <laughs> is what they said. So I said, okay, God. So after I exhaust all of, you know, I, I said, okay, God, I did everything I, did to, that I could do to try to find this leader. Um, can you point me in the right direction? Three days later, I get a postcard in the mail from Preston Harrington about a service he's having. And who's the speaker? Drop the mic. <laughs> and it says the speaker is Bishop Michael. So I call him and I say, hey, my name is David Brad. And he says, I know who you are. I said, I want to come to your service. I said, because I've been trying to find Bishop Michael Blue for over a year. He says, okay, will you come and minister? I said, absolutely. And I go to the service and I meet Bishop Blue and I bring all my singers and we minister. And so I... I'm looking for, you know, the pomp and circumstance of a bishop to walk in the door. I'm looking for, you know, 30 adjutants. I'm looking for, you know, the, the, you see what you see. And I, I keep looking. I never see that. And then I see three people walk through the door. It was Preston Harrington and two other people. And they just walk in and stand like they just came to be in the service. One of them was Bishop Michael Blue. And so when he took the platform, I said, that's him? I'd never seen him before. And he was so humble about it. I said, okay, this is going someplace because his humility is like through the roof, right? And he preaches that night, and then he talks about a conference that he's doing. So the next conference he does, I get in my car and drive, right? And I drive here. Um, not halfway even knowing where I'm going. I found a hotel in Florence, um, and I called, and I said, okay, hey, I'm here. Because Bishop had been listening to me. Uh, he remembered me from the Myrna Summers Project, and I called him and said that I'm here, and I started coming to all the events here. Um, and everything that I have learned, I have used in other settings. You know, God has a purpose. So can you pull that scripture up for me? Uh, Ezekiel 4430. Uh, so uh, this scripture, um, so my, but let me ask you a question. Will you do whatever the Bible says do? Uh, yeah, that was kind of weak. Yeah. It's not a trick question. Will you do whatever God says do if it's in the word of God? Okay, so here we go. Okay, so I'm going to read this for you. If you can see it up on the screen, you can follow. It says, and the first of all the first fruits of all things and every oblation of all, of every sort of your oblation shall be the priest. You shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. Okay, that's in the Bible, right? Um, I was with Bishop Iona Locke uh, at the Word Network. And she pointed the scripture out. So uh, you can keep it up for just a second, right? So this scripture represents a principle called truma. Everybody say truma, right? So this, I did some research and I found out that truma is you give 2.5% of all of your increase to your supervising priest. And every time you do it, your supervising priest commands the blessing to rest on your household. Right? So uh, I saw this person. I said, you know, okay, let me try it. So, like, 
let's say you have $100. $2, the first $2.50 goes to your supervising priest, which would be Archbishop, which would be uh, Bishop uh, Michael Blue. Amen? Right? And so then, as when you do that, he then speaks the blessing to rest upon your household. And that means everything connected to your house is blessed at a level that you've never seen, right? So uh, I tried this principle, and I was like, okay, let me give it a shot. So everything I got, right, I gave it to, uh, I, I would give it to a leader and just say, um, and I would tell them, you have to speak the blessing over my house. And they would speak the blessing over my household, right? So fast forward, my sister passes away, right? Um, it really bothers my mom. Right. It hurts my mom to see her child, you know, and so we do the funeral and after the funeral, you know, we had closure. The service was great. And so, but then about a month later, my mom went to a doctor's appointment and they said that she had lymphoma. Right. They said that uh, that she had a very, a very aggressive case of lymphoma. And so. They took her into the hospital and started doing, you know, the preliminary treatments, getting her ready for chemo and so on. And I go in and I speak to the doctors and they and I ask them, I said, give me the straight story. Right. I said, tell me what it really is. So they say, well, what they say to me is 75 percent of the people who go on a ventilator never survive. And I'm like, well, I don't know what you tell me that for, because my mother's not on a ventilator. She's not going on one. Right. And so um, I pray and talk to God. I was like, OK, God, you've had everything connected to my life all these years. I know you got this. Right. So um, a couple nights later, they say, we're going to do the chemo. We're going to do it in the middle of the night, like two in the morning. Right. And that day before they gave me every negative process prognosis they could give me. And I said to them, well, I said, well, you know. I trusted God before I met you. And I will trust God when I walk out the door and my mother walks out with me. Right? With me all day. Right? So my mom goes in and she's in the hospital and they do the chemo and they do the first round of it. Right? And they do the first round. And that morning, all the doctors come in and they look like they're coming in to see the worst. And they say, Mrs. Bratton, how are you doing? She says, I feel great. Best night of sleep I had in a long time. Where's the food? Right? And so then they're confounded because they don't understand. Right? And, um, and they said, well, your mom seems to be doing well. And I said, well, God is doing better. Right? And so my mom I don't even know, remember, know if she remembers, she said that she said, she pulled me uh, close to her and she said, Jesus says my mansion's not ready yet, but when it's ready, I'm out. She said, for, so for right now, she said, go ahead and start finding a new house in South Carolina. I'm good. When I tell you, when she said that, I said, okay, God. And so, you know, uh, everybody's always asking, how's your mom doing? And I, when I say she still drives, she still cooks her own food, does her own laundry. Um, so, you know, we got a ring doorbell at home. And I, every day I see her going in and out. And, and I was like, uh, and I talked to her from South Carolina through the ring doorbell. I said, like, hey, mom, you out again? She said, I'm doing fine. <laughs> you know, but and every round of chemo that she did after that, uh, she said, it was like I was just doing an IV for a long time because I haven't felt any effects. Right? I promise you, if you trust God, forget about people and just trust God. If you don't understand that God is controlling your life by now, you have lost your mind. It's only the grace of God that you're sitting here. I watched God do it. 
I watched God do it, right? So um, everything that I've been a part of, uh, God gave me a relationship. Somebody say relationships. relationships. Songwriters. God put two of the greatest songwriters in front of me ever. Timothy Wright and this writer named V. Michael McKay, yeah. right? V. Michael McKay was the one who wrote The Potter Wants to Put You yes. Back Together yeah. Again. And he wrote all these great songs. He just happens to come to the city where I'm in college to do a workshop and do a live recording with the people in town. I just happened to go to rehearsal because somebody t dragged me to a rehearsal and I just happened to end up on keys. And I, and I just happened to end up being the musical director for a, a project and I had never done it before. And he said to me, he said, okay, you, he said, you're gonna be the musical director. He said, figure out intros and all this kind of stuff for all the records, right? Had never done it before but he gave me the opportunity, right? Somebody say relationships, right? Um, as an arranger, Timothy Wright took me under his wing, right? Um, I, was, I was happy and content playing organ for him. Happy and content playing organ for him. And he says, um, at the, and this was before the first New York Fellowship record, he said, uh, have a song ready next week, you're gonna teach it. And I said, who? I said, I'm gonna be on keys. He said, not this time. He said, you're going to teach a song. So I go home and I say, okay, God, I have never done a, a song um, in, a, in a recording setting. So I'm just going to crack the Bible open somewhere. And wherever I open the Bible, I'm, I'm going to start singing it. And you show me that it could be a song if you want me to do this. I open uh, the Bible to Revelations 1, which is normally not a book that people write songs from. And it says, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. The revelation of the Lord Jesus of things which are soon to come bears a record of the word of God, the testimony of his son. Blessed is he that heareth and readeth the words of this prophecy. Keep those things written therein for the time has come. Right? I wrote, so that's the scripture I opened up to. So I just start singing it. And I sing it all during the week. And I was like, okay. I don't know how this is going to work out, uh, but I'm going to teach this song at this Timothy Wright rehearsal and see what happens, right? I have no drive for the song. I don't know what the drive is going to be. This, this had to be uh, like maybe, I don't know, 92, 94, somewhere in there. So, and the time is significant, and I'll tell you why later. So I write the song, and I'm up teaching the song, right? And so I don't have a drive. So I tell the musicians, keep playing, and then I start singing, we love him, we praise him, we thank him for all that he's done, yeah. right? Uh, which later became a part of one of Donnie McClurkin's songs, but we'll talk about that later. So um, I started just singing, and then the choir sang it, and I taught the parts and everything, and that became the drive. And we just began to repeat that, and we got to, we love him, we love him, we love, and we started to sing that. So um, when I tell you the power of God took over the rehearsal and the drive of that song, and even at the live recording, um, God took over, right? And so I learned that even when you put your name on a song that you wrote, you have to acknowledge that God wrote it and you did not, right? And so that song catapulted me to being able to write uh, and from that, Timothy Wright kicked me off the choir and told me, go start a group because you need to write songs and you're hiding behind me. Right? Uh, choir master, uh, relationships. Somebody say relationships. So when I was a kid, my minister of music was this guy named Steve Roberts. Right? So I had no clue who he was. All I knew was he was the minister of music. Not knowing he was the uh, uh, choir in charge of the GMWA Mass Choir, and he recorded Daryl Coley for the first time on a song called He'll Never Let You Down. And, but he was my minister, minister of music. So um, I'm the drummer at the church, and I'm happy and content playing drums. So it's a Sunday afternoon. He calls me on the phone and says, hey, I'm at this church uh, called St. Elizabeth. I need you to come and play. So I grab my sticks, my mom lets me use the car, I drive to the church. I get there with my drumsticks in my hand, and he, and he says to me, not drums, piano. 
And I was, because he had been watching me play the piano on the sly in the church all the time. He says, I said, well, I don't know the song. He says, well, sit down next to me. I'm going to show you the chord. And he sits down and he shows me the chord. He said, I'm going to go get up to direct the choir. When I get up to direct the choir, you play this chord while I'm directing. And I sit down on the piano and uh, because I had never played piano before, I start playing and my finger starts bleeding because I broke one of my nails cracked. I had never played before. So I'm sitting there playing the piano, wiping off the blood, playing the piano, wiping off the blood, playing the piano, and wiping off the blood. But I was, co I was committed to finish that song. And he gave me an assignment and I wasn't going to let nothing stop me. So I kept, so I played the song did not go there to play piano. And, he, and after that, he said, you have no business on the drums. He said, you have to move to your next assignment, right? Fast forward, I have a conversation with Bishop Blue. Bishop Blue says, because I said, Bishop, I said, you know, I've, I'm supposed to move to these other assignments, but I want to keep doing music. And he said to me, you have to move to your next assignment because you stunt the growth of the people behind you. Yeah, because when you move on, somebody else moves in because they have to move up, right? But if you never move to that next location, you miss where God has for you to go, and you stunt the growth of somebody else who's supposed to be there. The worst thing you could ever do is overstay your assignment. Jesus. Okay, so... Um, uh, so I'm, I'm going to move. I'm, I'm going to move as fast as I humanly possibly can. I'm going to go fast. Um, so as a producer, I worked under Savoy. They gave me my first opportunity to produce a record. I didn't even know what I was doing, but they heard what I did on the other records, and they thought I was producing Timothy Wright's records, and I wasn't. But I was playing and doing all the work of the producer, so that by the time I got an opportunity to be a producer, I had already been doing the work and didn't even know it. But I had already, already been doing the assignment. Uh, worship leader. How did I ever get a chance to be a worship leader? So for years, I was on the organ at an apostolic church. And I was the only organist. So everything I did, I did from the organ. I led songs, directed everything. So then I get a call to go to Allen Cathedral, uh, Rev, Pastor Flake of Revenue Lane, and, and my friend Stanley Brown. And there's a lady near, there named Gwen Warren. Gwen Warren hears me teach a, a record a song at a Timothy Wright recording. The recording took place at Allen. She was in her office. When she heard my song, she came down. I was standing on the side of the platform. She said, can I talk to you? She pulls me out into the hallway and says, um, you're supposed to be here. Figure it out. She said, there's an assignment for you here. She said, I don't know what you're doing, but there's an assignment here for you. Right? And she talked, and I could feel the power of God while she's talking. I was like, I don't even know this lady. But I could feel the power of God. I was like, a month later, I end up, I get a call to go to Allen to, for a meeting. They said, Dave, just come by Allen. I get there, and Jeff Davis is already there playing drum. And he says, well, uh, what you going to teach? I said, what do you mean teach? I don't have no song to teach. He said, you're going to teach a song, so have something ready. Stanley's going to come in in about 15 minutes and have a song ready. I had nothing. So I go over. I pull out my Bible once again. I say, okay, God, wherever I open this Bible, I'm going to write a song based on that scripture. And whatever you do is what it's going to be because I have nothing. Right? Somebody say, God has everything. I open the scripture. I open the Bible to Psalm 63. Right? And I start reading, oh, God, you are my God. Early will I seek your face. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. I write that song in 15 minutes. So as soon as I finished writing it, Stanley Brown walks in the room and says, hey, let me hear the song you got. And I said, well, I just, put, I just got this little this thing I just heard. I sung it to him. He said, great, we're going to teach it to the choir. I don't know the harmony parts I'm going to do. I don't, know, I, I don't know. All I know is I had this melody. So as I'm teaching it, God tells me when to do harmony and when to do unison. He's like, okay, do it. And I, was, I did this part, unison. Then I did a harmony. Then I went back to the unison. Not, and I did not have a plan. I just had God. And that was plain, right? Um, so while I was at Allen, they told me, okay, you're going to lead worship. You don't have to play because we have a whole band to play behind you. And, we had, and they had an event called Candlelight. And this event at Candlelight... Um, 
at the beginning of it's a lot of pageantry. So they had nobody to do worship, and they said, well, you get up and do worship. There's no singers behind you, but there will be maybe two musicians. And I get up, and I'd say, okay, God, you got this. I start leading worship, and uh, God just takes over, and that was my, and they didn't know that was my first time ever leading worship, right? Um, as a teacher, my mom was a teacher, so I became a teacher like my mom, <laughs> She, I watched her teach for years, and she taught young people in, who had mental challenges in a mental institution. And she changed their lives uh, through teaching. So I said, okay, she's going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a teacher. Preacher of the word. Somebody say relationships. Uh, Bishop Michael Blue came into my life at, right before I started going to seminary. So I had... Bishop Blue is a foundation, and then I went to seminary, and all of those things brought me into uh, the ability and, and the opportunities to preach the word. Uh, businessman, my dad was a businessman. He owned property, more than one house. He worked multiple jobs. Uh, and my uncle, him and my dad, they owned houses everywhere. And I didn't realize how much of a big deal that was until they got ready to move, and they sold these houses for 10 times what they bought it for. Right. That taught me um, professional relationships. Teach uh, this teacher named David Kinley helped me at Benedict. And he said um, uh, he literally uh, he said, you need to learn business because otherwise you won't know how to handle your money. And so uh, life influence relationships. I worked with Edwin Hawkins for years. Uh, I used to hang around a love center and I never knew that their music was worldwide. I thought it was just in the neighborhood. But at Love Center, the people who went to Love Center, Danny Bell Hall, uh, Maurice White from Earth, Wind & Fire, um, the group Sylvester, the group Tony, 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 Danny Bell, uh, Tremaine, all of the Hawkins people, Daryl Coley, all these people went to church there. And I got to watch all of them not knowing that they were known around the world. Um, uh, every musician, you may not understand it, but you need a wife. Right? Yeah, a hush fell over Jerusalem. You need a wife. Right. You need somebody because the Bible says it's not good that man should be alone. Trust me, you think you're cool in your 20s and your 30s and your 40s when you're playing. When you get in your 50s and somebody needs to tell you to go to the doctor and you got nobody. Um, uh, Keith Wonderboy Johnson was a good friend of mine. He died alone. Right. Uh, another friend of mine, J.J. Howell, died alone. You need somebody in your life to tell you you need to go to the doctor. You need to change your life. Um, uh, you also need a pastor. You need a mentor. Everybody needs somebody to speak into their life and be a mentor, which means you have to be subject to somebody. Um, uh, do not measure your excellence by the check you receive. Right? Because what will happen is if you do that, when the check is small, your playing will be small. But if you measure your excellence by the gift God gave you and operate that gift at the very highest level, then you'll never have to worry. I've never negotiated with a pastor ever, right? I've never had to. I walked in the door and almost every place that I've been, whatever you do is fine. Whatever you do is fine. But I gave 100% to what I was doing and they always felt like, well, we're not doing enough. And I never had to go back and renegotiate. Your gift will make room for you, not your mouth. Right. You can't talk your way into a raise. You can't attitude yourself into more money. You have to just use the gift and just let God use the gift. Um, uh, one thing I want to tell musicians, AI is about to clean your clock. Because AI is now you can you can go to AI and say, create a worship song that's never been heard. And AI will create a song, orchestration, strings, horns, everything. The only thing that's going to separate you is the anointing of God. Right? Um, my time is far spent. Um, I thank God, Bishop Blue, thank you for the opportunity to serve. Um, I truly believe that if you trust God, everything will make sense in your life. Everything you do, everything you think, every resource you have will make sense. If you, somebody say, trust God in all things. God bless you. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Thank you, sir. Bless you. Oh, no, no. If you're a recipient of benefit from having been a part of this session, would you please let Elder know that we appreciate him? Elder J. David Bratson, come on. Clap. clap your hands and let him know we appreciate him. Amen. I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be with you. If you will only trust me. He told us to trust God. Praise God. I will. I will be with you. That's the promise of God. I will be with you. I will be with you. I will be God for it. Trust me. Thank you, Jesus. Trust me. Let's lift our hands and let the Lord know that we trust Him. Lift your hands and rededicate yourself to trust God. Rededicate, recommit, re hallelujah, reconsecrate yourself that you will trust in the Lord at all times. That you will trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Father, thank you for one more chance to be reminded that you're waiting on us to come to a place of trust. You said that if all, in all our ways we would acknowledge you, that you would direct our paths. And we thank you for it. We praise you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody clap your hands and give thanks unto the Lord with your voice. Give thanks unto the Lord with your voice. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated if you will. I want to ask you to let us prepare a gift tonight. A tangible gift, a material gift. I feel as if this this word, this teaching, this testimony has been of priceless value. I believe someone has been stirred, someone has been able to reframe your journey through a different lens. Would you agree with that? I want to ask you to prepare a gift for us. I'm grateful for all of the pastors who are here. And when I say for us, prepare it while I'm talking in that sense not for me I want you to prepare your gifts we appreciate Bishop Antoine Bellamy and Pastor Joshana Bellamy we appreciate them we appreciate Pastor Gerald Fryer and Lady Beverly Fryer Lady Jerry Young we honor her being present Praise God. All of the Pastor Obana is here. He's, he's serving in this congregation, but we honor him. Thank you, Lord. We appreciate um, Elder Sumo is here in, as an instructor, but he has recently begun to walk in a pastoral mantle as well. We honor him. <laughs> Praise God for Pastor Marcus and Pastor uh, First Lady Letitia Scott. May we thank the Lord for them. Certainly, we're grateful, always appreciative for Pastor Wendy H. Wyatt. We thank God for our second vice presiding prelate, Bishop Melvin Lambert.
Are there any other pastors, senior pastors that are present tonight? Any other senior pastors? We thank God for everybody. You don't have to be a pastor for us to love you or to honor you, but we acknowledge them by name to express our gratitude for them being in our midst and their encouraging the saints. We do thank God for First Lady Rachel. She, she's not in Rachel Brown. She was with us earlier. I want to honor Pastor Melinda Blue. Thank God for my wife, Pastor Melinda. And once again, we thank God for this dear man of God, Elder J. David Branson. Let's let him know we appreciate it. Everyone with a gift, I want you to, to get it now and stand, please. Tomorrow, I'm asking as many of you as can and will to meet us at 10.30 a.m. At 10.30 a.m., there will be just a little snack, muffins, fruit, that kind of thing. But we ask you to take that opportunity to fellowship one with another. Then at 11, we will begin the breakout sessions. The sessions that took place tonight will be extended tomorrow morning. And uh, if you say you were benefited, then I'm sure you'll, you'll appreciate more, right? And I do encourage you to invite someone else to be a part. Invite someone. Don't invite them in the morning. Invite them tonight. Invite them after we will have dismissed. Invite them, text them, call them, what have you, and bring them with you. We don't want these men and women to have come from various parts of the nation and we not gather. And, and, and there are extenuating circumstances, but there are also excuses. And let's not be guilty of offering excuses when God has given us access to genius. You know, you don't have to register to be in this meeting, but some of what is being received in this meeting, high levels of registration are exacted of people, you know. And so don't take it lightly because it didn't cost you to enter. Um, the, the registration packet with the book and uh, the notes from last night and so forth, those things are still available, and we encourage you to avail yourself to them. Uh, uh, they will bless your life if you let them. I'm going to pronounce the benediction when we will have brought our gifts as well. We're going to do it at once. And so I'm going to ask you to prepare God's, God's gift tonight. Don't, don't, don't cheapen it. Nobody has to promise you anything because God has promised you everything. Don't misunderstand me. There are times when God will, hallelujah, when God will speak and he'll give us an utterance and we declare what he has decreed. But if he doesn't say anything beyond the written word, that's enough. If you believe it. Hallelujah. <laughs> We're not going to get involved in that tonight. Get your very best gift. You see the means by which we sow our seed. And I'm going to ask you to lift it before the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I believe God will breathe on it. Do you believe it? I'm listening to Elder Bratton, and I'm just thinking how amazing that story is all the way from ten dollars a week I believe it was well all the way from nothing to ten dollars a week and now he mentioned multiple streams of income but among those streams are the multiple streams within the stream and God figured that out he didn't have to concoct that. God worked that out. And so I want you to let's prepare a gift. I always say, I often say, that remember that if it means nothing to you, it means nothing to God. David said, I will not offer God of that which cost me nothing. Don't give God nothing. Give God something. 
lift your gifts. Now, Father, thank you for the privilege of sowing into your work. We believe that, yes, Lord, I praise you, that not only will men and women come to understand their gifts from a cognitive and conceptual perspective, but they will see that gift begin to do what your word said, whithersoever it turns, it prospers. And I believe that there are those tonight who are recipients of a prospering grace that is not limited to the material, but includes the material. Because in many of our instances, we are not going after material increase with the spirit of covetousness. But rather, material increase would free us to do what we need to do for you without restraint. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for financial freedom. In the name of Jesus, thank you for material freedom. Thank you that you loose us from having to be dependent upon a man, dependent upon a paycheck, dependent upon any system other than the one that you've ordained. And I command these seeds to be fruitful and to multiply, to replenish the earth, to subdue it, and to have dominion in the matchless name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And Father, as your people will depart from this place, let your blessing rest upon them. Let no weapon formed against them prosper. Take us to our homes and bear us other destinations safely. Bring us back together at the appointed hour where we will be careful to give to you all the glory, honor, and praise that are due unto your name. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And those of you that are streaming with us and in the replay, you're welcome to sow as well. I know many of you are doing so. God bless you, and he does. Say these words after me. We are what the word of God says that we are. We have what the word of God says that we have. And we can do what the word of God says that we can do. For we are committed to bring pleasure to Christ's heart and fame to his name. Amen. Until we meet again, may the peace of God go with you. Please meet us in the morning. Please prepare yourself. Be on time. We're going to pray, but we're going to also be a part of these sessions. I didn't mention, remember that after the breakouts, we're coming back here together. We're going to hear from Pastor Wyatt. We're going to hear from uh, Elder Juanita Francis and uh, uh, her entourage as well. We're believing God to do great things. Can you say amen? Amen. The ushers will direct you. Please follow their instructions. And after you will have brought your gifts, you are uh, free to continue walking. You are dismissed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it's cheeseburger night tonight. Please uh, make your way into the, uh, into the multi-purpose area. And uh, whatever else you have or have had, just add a cheeseburger to it. All right? We appreciate Elder uh, Davis and Lady Davis for preparing. God bless. Praise of the Lord.